Bob Holiday, WRL.com. Coach, good to see you. Good I was reminiscing last night that some of your better teams in the 90s had players named Holiday. There was Corey Holiday and then Bonnie Holiday. And look at the roster, you have another player of that name this year. I mean, he's just a freshman, but maybe it's an omen. My question, you led the league in total offense, averaging 537 yards in spite of the fact that you allowed more sacks than everybody except for Duke and Syracuse. What goes into keeping Sam Howell upright more often this year? Well, thank you, Bob. Um, and Bob is not kin to any of those holidays, by the way. Um, but welcome, everybody, and glad we get to see everybody back in person. Uh, so it's just uh, we're blessed to do this, and it's, it's fun to have everybody back. So thank you very much. Uh, the, the biggest thing we're looking at with our sacks is we've got the same offensive lineman for the third straight year, with the exception of Charlie Heck. He went to the Texans. So we, we've got more experience than probably anybody in the country in the offensive line uh, and at tight end because Garrett Walston's coming back. Uh, we have also established more depth over the last two years. So we can actually play two offensive lines, and we haven't been able to do that. We've been playing six and seven players. And the third thing is we've looked at every sack for the two years that we've been here. We've looked at why. Uh, Sam's committed to getting the ball out of his hands faster some because he's so competitive he wants to make every play. And we also know that we've got to do a better job up front um, in all those cases and use our backs. We, one of the reasons we took uh, Ty Chandler from Tennessee is the only grad transfer we took is we didn't want to go to Virginia Tech with young backs that had not played and had big eyes and fumbled the ball or not know how to protect. And Ty has played in a lot of big games. Let's go to our right side, fifth row. Ewan McCreeth, Herb FM Sports Radio. Coach, we always use the terms chemistry and continuity about players on the field, but can you talk a little bit about now entering your third season with Phil and Sam, that kind of comfortability and how that translates on the field? Yes, uh, we, we use the word culture all the time, and I'm not really sure what that means. We, we I hear alignment, I hear chemistry, uh, and, and all of it means we're all on the same page. So Sam knows our offense as, as well as Phil Longo does. In fact, Phil interviewed for a job earlier, and I thought I'll make Sam the offensive coordinator and just move on. We, we'll save some money. Uh, now with name, image, and likeness, maybe I could have paid Sam as the offensive coordinator and the quarterback. I don't know as we, we look at that. But um, continuity is really, really important if it's good. And you have to continue to work to bring in great ideas. At Texas, we had the same staff most of our 16 years. The good thing was we had continuity. The bad thing is we didn't get many new ideas. So when we brought in Larry Porter this year, after Robert Gillespie left, it was good. Got some new thoughts to a, a really good offense. And then when we brought in John Lilly after Tim Brewster the first year, we had some pro thoughts with our tight end in the tight end game, so our tight end game's better now than it was two years ago. So we, we like continuity, but we don't mind a change every now and then just to create new ideas. Coach, to your left in the first row, Dan Tortora, Wake Up Call, DT.com. Coach, what have been the pillars of orchestrating such a positive turnaround in North Carolina football, in your opinion? Dan, Dan, number one is, is we had to have the buy-in from the administration and Bubba Cunningham sitting in here, and I don't want to embarrass him, but the, the university has done everything we've asked them to do. And we've promised never to ask for anything that's not going to help, help the experience of our student athletes or help us win. So one of the reasons we've had continuity with our coaches is we're, we're paying them. And we're paying them at a high level, and, and that way we're not going to lose them for money. They may have to go to a different place, like Robert Gillespie wanted to look at pros closer to home, so I got that. But we're not having a lot of coaches leave, and, and that's a positive. Uh, secondly, our, our, I challenged our fans to buy in. People said fans aren't coming to the games. I said, come on, fans. If you, you want to be a great football program, you got to be a great fan base. And we sold out every game, one of seven teams, I think, to sell out every game in 2019, and we've already sold all of our season tickets, which is amazing after the very difficult year most people have had financially over the last year. And then when you recruit a staff that's a high quality staff that knows the area and fits the school, understands who we are academically, understands who fits at our school, it, it really helps you in recruiting. And, and so we have a, a great product, 
um, a, a great academic school, small campus. It's one of the nicest in the country. We've got a tremendous staff, a real commitment from our administration and our fan base is all in. And, and when you put those things together, it, it makes it for a really special opportunity moving forward. Coach Wright's side, about the sixth row in the middle. Stand up, please. Thank you. Corlin Griffin with a three-point conversion. Coach, you lost two running backs to the NFL draft this year, but you replaced them with Ty Chandler, who you spoke on. Can you elaborate a little bit more on his role in this offense? Yes, the, uh, you, you lose Javante Williams and, and you lose Michael Carter. You lose a lot of your offense, and, and they were tough. They were smart. They could catch. They could block. But they, but they protected the ball, and that might be the most important thing they did over two years. I think we lost six fumbles in two years, and, and that kind of goes unnoticed unless you're fumbling. But it, it's really, really important. So with, with Ty Chandler, he was recruited by Tommy Thigpen, who was on our staff. He was coached by Robert Gillespie. So when he went into the portal, we knew how good he was. And he's 210 pounds now, I think. He, he's fit in with our team really, really well. He's having fun. He had a really good spring. Since he's had four years of, of being physical and uh, being hit by Tennessee and Alabama, and Georgia, I mean, uh, by Georgia and uh, Florida and Alabama and Auburn, uh, we didn't beat him up this spring. We haven't talked a lot about him. But we think he is kind of the guy that fits between Javante Williams and Michael Carter. He's the 210-pound back. He can run it up inside. He's got tremendous hands. He knows what to do. But he also has the speed, speed that when he gets it in space, he has a chance to score. So we got to find some other guys with him. But we think he has a chance to step up and be a special player for us. Coach, straight up the middle there to your left with Luke DeCock. Hey, Mac, Luke T. Cock, Raleigh N and O. Um, you mentioned wanting Ty for that opening game at Virginia Tech. What's sort of your, I don't know if level of concern is the right phrase, but there's a, a challenge there in starting the season on a Friday night in Blacksburg. How do you want to handle that and prepare your team for that? Luke, after 32 years as a head coach, I've looked at it both ways. You, would you like to have an easier team and it's kind of a scrimmage and you get to work through things and you don't have to show anything? Yes. But do your players get more excited in the summer off-season program if they're opening up uh, against a um, coastal rival that's really good and we went to six overtimes and got beat the last time we were there? So I, I really think it's, it's, it's great for us. We've gotten a tremendous amount of publicity. We've been kind of a media darling. Um, so let's keep our mouth shut now and go see if we're any good. Uh, but we got to play because Virginia Tech's, uh, it's an unbelievable place to play. It's, it's a fun place to play. Um, they've got a really good football team. Um, so it, it'll be a great challenge. So it'll be a fun way for us to start the season. Coach, hard right here about the fifth row standing. John, you cited Ricky Williams as an example that teams win a Heisman, not school promotions. On the other side of that, could you talk about as uh, he becomes, your player becomes a leading candidate and the pressure mounts later in the season. How you handle that? Uh, when we went to Texas, the previous team was four and seven. And Ricky said, you know, the Heisman's not important. Well, um, Heisman Ricky Williams was his email. So it was kind of important, I think. <laughs> I kind of noticed that as, as he told me it wasn't important. Uh, so what we found is that Ricky was the best player on our team, so he was really our best defensive player because we weren't any good on defense, but as long as he stayed on the field and ran the ball, we didn't have to go out there on defense, so it, it helped us. So we really got into discussions like we were killing Rice and Ken Hatfield's a friend, and, and Ricky had just gained 43 yards against Kansas State the week before. I left him in. He gained 255 yards, I think, and Ken was great after the game. He said, I got it. You got to keep him in. But there's that fine line with Colt McCoy and Vince Young. When you're winning a game, how long do you keep them in for stats for the Heisman, and when do you pull them out for safety and trying to get a backup quarterback ready to play? So it's a, it's a, it's a delicate path that you have to follow to try to figure out how to make all that work. And uh, Sam's so good, he's about winning. He knows that we've got to have another quarterback ready to go in the future. So we'll navigate those times with him. But, but we've said, uh, whether it's name, image, and likeness, or, or whether it's the awards that you're going to get, it's, a, it's about your ball. It's not about your brand. 
And if we play well, if Sam's going to play great, if we play well enough as a team around him and we have a chance to win a lot of games, he'll be right in the mix with that Heisman thing, regardless of what we say or, or what we do. If we don't play well as a team, it'll, it'll drift away. Folks, we could do this for about an hour and a half with this momentum. Only a few more questions. In the very back, last row, she's about to stand. Alyssa Ray, WNCN. With you guys launching the group licensing for name, image, and likeness, how proactive has the university been? It seems like they've kind of been on the front, like frontier of this name, image, and likeness and really embraced it. How nice has that been for you to have that backing in the athletic department? Alyssa, it's, it's great for us. Bubba and his team have been working on this for two years. We had a discussion with our team uh, this spring before COVID hit, so last spring, about what this meant and where it was going. And in fact, Bubba asked if there are any questions at the end of the discussion, and Sam Howell stood up and said, I don't want this to be about the quarterback. I don't want it to be disruptive in the locker room. And, and that, that's one of the reasons Bubba and his team are working so hard on group licensing. And they're one of the first to do it. And that means that the backup right guard is going to have a chance to be involved with opportunities that he wouldn't be if it's three players on your team that are. So the, the, I was not in favor of, of um, get it taking away amateurism and, and moving forward with name, image, and likeness. And then Sally told me something that really makes sense, that the regular student gets to use, if it's a musician, he gets to use his talent to make money. So why shouldn't a student athlete get to do the same thing? So I got it. And now we've got to all figure out those guidelines and what it means. And group licensing helps your whole team. And, and Sam will be okay. Some of the other players will be okay with their opportunities. But what Bubba's trying to do, what I want us to do, is be able to help that whole team. Now, are we making guys mature faster than normal? Yeah, we're talking about federal tax and state tax and your agent and uh, the amount of uh, the percentage of money that your agent is is going to take away from what you get and, and, and the legal part of this. So uh, they're having to grow up a lot faster than before, which may be a good thing in the long run. So since it's here, we're all in. North Carolina should be a place where name, image, and likeness should be a great advantage for us because we have a lot of great people, but we got to figure out what that means within the rules and um, how we can help our guys with opportunities without getting involved ourselves. Coach, we've identified your last two questions. Keep it on the left side in the very back for our first of two. Hey, Coach, Bridget Condon with ABC 11. You've shown your support of vaccination. You put your video up in May of you getting your shot. What have your conversations been with your players during the off season and what percent of your team is vaccinated at this point? Uh, Bridget, it, it's a, COVID's obviously back. I mean, I, I watch very closely every day. We've, we've got some concerns at the Olympics. We've got a pro baseball game that was postponed the other night. We've got a basketball coach in the playoffs that didn't get to participate. We've got a golfer that was taken out of a championship on Sunday. So it's, it's here, it's real. So I was hoping, like all of us, it would be gone away and probably people have gotten a little more careless. So we're meeting tomorrow for an hour. We've been working for the last 10 days on a plan to go back and make sure that, that we're as COVID safe with our team as we can. Um, we're, we're not at 85% for uh, herd immunity with our entire team yet. We're getting really close. We have encouraged everybody to get it. Some, as we know across the, our country and our world, do not want to get it. We, we understand that. That's fair. Our job is to educate. Their job is to make personal decisions. That's the way we do for the NFL. That's the way we do with everyone in our program. But we have a great plan in place with what we've got to make sure that we get the numbers right in each meeting room for 85% herd immunity, in our training table, in our locker room, and, and that's what we're going to do. 85% herd immunity, we've been told, means you can go back to a normal process. Maybe the unvaccinated people have to wear a mask still, and the vaccinated ones can wear a mask if they want that as an option. Uh, and that's, that's in our football building and in our football program. But we, we feel like right now we have a great plan in place that we can get back to as near normal as possible. Coach, your last question to the right about fifth, uh, fourth row. 
Uh, Coach, hi, I'm Mike Settle, Double Fries, No Slaw. You went down to uh, Tallahassee last year and lost a game. A lot of people, including yourself, I'm sure, didn't expect to. Um, given your ties to Florida State and your quarterback's ties to Florida State during the recruiting process, is that a game you guys potentially have circled as something special, or is every game kind of even keel as you go into the season? Mike, what the, the first question I got today was, <clears throat> you guys are getting so much hype and everybody expects you to win every game, so... Uh, how can you talk about one in the middle when you've got to go to Virginia Tech in the opener? So we, we basically have a three-game season, and that's what I've told the players. I'll start talking to you more national after three games if you haven't lost a game. But, but let, let's quit talking. We've gotten hype. We've been hugged. We've, been, we've had sugar thrown all over us, and we're, we're all enjoying it. We like it. Uh, so let's, let's clean it off, and let's get back to facts, because we were fifth in the country when we went to Florida State and about 25th when we were leaving. And, and that took about three hours to drop that far. So, and there were two conferences that weren't playing when we were fifth in the country. So I was trying to explain to them, you're not the fifth best team in the country without telling them you're not the fifth best team in the country, but we gotta play. And, and nobody's good enough anymore to go out there and stand around. So we, we gotta, we, we've got some great older players that are leaders, three of them are here today. And then we've got a bunch of young guys and the young guys have to grow up. And, and we've been circled by everybody in this league. In fact, I can tell even in, in recruiting, people are being really critical and they're cutting us in recruiting now. That, that's, I'm so proud of that. That didn't happen the first year, nobody cared. So now that we're getting a little better, I'm, I'm so excited that people are critical of us. So that's a good thing. But yes, we'd like to beat Florida State, but that's way down that list of issues before we get to it.